if we're ready. Um, does that sound good to you all, Dr. Coleman, Dr. Camargo? Yep. Ready? All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Today um, is our second virtual uh, project group for Horse Science 101. Welcome. If you all were not able to join us last month, that's all right. Um, it was just kind of an icebreaker. Get to know you all and um, go over the website. So this month, we will be talking about bit mechanics with Dr. Bob Coleman. Um, Dr. Bob Coleman is an associate professor and equine extension specialist at the University of Kentucky. He grew up showing horses and harness ponies in Brandon, Manitoba. In 1975, he received his bachelor's in agriculture, major animal science from the University of Manitoba. And in 1978, he received his master's in animal science from the University of Manitoba and graduated with his doctorate from the University of Alberta in animal science in 1998. Dr. Coleman worked as an animal nutritionist for two feed companies in Western Canada before joining the Alberta Horse Industry Branch, where he worked for 18 years as a provincial extension horse specialist. He's currently in an Associate Extension Professor in the Department of Animal and Food Sciences in the College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment at the University of Kentucky. He teaches classes EQM 210, Tools and Tech in the Equine Industry, EQM 340, Equine Facility Design and Management, and he's published and co-published numerous publications for the University of Kentucky and thehorse.com. His research interests include equine nutrition utilization of forages, horse care management, and industry economics. He's also the advisor of the UK equestrian team and co-advisor of the Collegiate Professional Horsemen's Association. Dr. Coleman, thank you so much for joining us today, and we will turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Mary Jane. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, as you can tell by this first slide, I have a slight interest in bits and what we use in the horse industry. Um, I do have, you may have heard the rumor, students at UK have heard it all the time about my uh, noticeable size of my bit collection. It runs about 475 bits. Um, not every not everyone is unique. There's a few that are the same, but uh, I have collected them and I use them a lot for uh, teaching. Well, oh, we're gonna have to go over here maybe. There we go. I, I saw this interesting article the other day. Um, and like everything, you know, we learn so much on Facebook, but I thought this was really interesting that they talked about how the development of the first bit and bridle was about a thousand BC. And it made such a difference. And I think we can appreciate this that it gave them better control when riding. But as uh, armies got better control of the horses, um, that led to the development of these, what they called mega empires, because uh, those empires had armies that could uh, melt with a lot of riders. And because they had better control, they were just more effective. So um, putting something on a horse's head and in his mouth in order to provide control has been around for a really long time. And if you look at some of the things like this picture on the screen, uh, well, they the cheeks are very elaborate. Uh, when you get right down to it, that mouthpiece is not much different than what we'll see in some of the other bits tonight. Uh, certainly it's turned green and that will be because of some oxidization of the mineral or the metal that was used to make the bit, but the design really hasn't changed very much. So when we put something on our horse's head like those warriors way back when, you know, it is for communication. You know, we're trying to make sure that we can stop, we can turn, we can maybe regulate speed, some just general control of what we're doing with the horse. And maybe if we need to, if we're in the show ring, have a particular frame, uh, we use the communication to the horse's mouth as part of, but not the only thing that will allow us to do all of these things mentioned. Um, we'll see horses that can stop and turn and you watch and the rider's hands haven't moved and you're really wondering uh, what was the communication? Well, the bit and the bridle is part of it, not necessarily all of it. If there's one thing that I would like you to take away tonight, 
that there's a snaffle bit and there's a curved bit. And lots of you are going to say, yep, I already know that. Good. Actually, that's probably excellent. But remember that it is the action, it's the mechanic of the bit. Uh, the snaffle and we'll look at it versus the curve bit that makes the difference. It's how the bit functions. It is not exactly what's in the in its mouth. So there's a lot of times people will look at a particular bit and say, well, that's a snaffle bit. And it really isn't. In, in actual fact, it's a curve bit. And probably the best example of that is the Tom Thumb, Tom Thumb snaffle. How many have ever seen one of those? All of us have. Is it a snaffle bit? No, it's not. It's a curb bit because it works off the of leverage. So we need to think about how the mechanics work before we make too many decisions or judgments as to what that bit actually is. So when we think about putting the bridle in the bit on the horse and in his mouth, we have to think about, you know, where is it going to interact? So certainly, the corners of the mouth, depending how much interaction there, it will be dependent on how you put the bridle on. And I'll show you some pictures later of some differences that might not be considered correct in certain parts of the industry, but in actual fact, uh, whether they're correct or not, I don't know, but I don't believe them to be incorrect. We need to think about the bars or the inner dental space. That's that spot that mother nature created uh, between the, the incisors and the canine and geldings and stallions and the molars and premolars. Uh, there's no teeth there. There are is bone. Um, it's not maybe well covered with a lot of tissue, so it can be fairly sensitive. Then we need to appreciate what our bit can do there. Uh, a lot of horses don't like a lot of pressure on their tongue, and certainly how we use our bits and what bits we use can put some pressure there. The palate or the roof of the horse's mouth, uh, again, it will be dependent on the structure of the bit. In a lot of cases, I think people look at bits and say, oh, that's going to do something to the palate or the horse, the roof of the horse's mouth, and look at something else and say, well, that will never do anything to the palate. And yet, in actual fact, they've got it flipped. And in some cases, a bit will. And in some cases, it won't. The curb area is more from the standpoint when we're using a leverage bit and we have a curb strap or a curb chain or a chin strap, depending on which discipline you ride, all three names for exactly the same piece of equipment. Uh, the pole will depend on the kind of bit we're using. And again, also, depending on what we're using, we may have some pressure on the nose. For most of us, though, we usually don't put very much pressure on the nose. That's going to come with some of the bitless bridles. And there certainly are some bridles and some bits out there that will put pressure on the nose and also impact all of the, the parts of the horse's mouth and, and a variety of places on the horse's head. But they're few and far between. I always like to start and think about the bits that I'm going to use and What's common to all of the bits? Well, they have a mouthpiece. All of them do. Uh, and we can think about it, and we'll look at some other pictures in a minute. But when we start to think about the mechanics, uh, is that mouthpiece thick or thin? And what difference does that make? Well, if you have a thick and very large mouthpiece, and I don't know if I can get this to work very well. But if we look here, so that's a pretty big mouthpiece compared to here, which is pretty thin. And so what's that going to do? It's going to make a difference in how the pressure from your hands interact with the horse's mouth. A wider, thicker, larger mouthpiece is going to disperse the pressure over a greater area. It's going to not have quite as specific an effect. So in a lot of cases, we think that that means it's a little less harsh, or it's not as strong, versus that very small, thin mouthpiece is going to concentrate the pressure from our hands and put a lot more pressure on the parts of the horse's mouth. And while that's true, and a lot of times we think, so a bigger, fatter, 
bit is going to be better for the horse, that actually is not true because it really depends not only on the mechanics from the bit, but the conformation of the horse. A horse that has a small mouth or has a very large tongue, and we put that great big fat bit in there, there might not be enough room for everything. And that causes discomfort just from the standpoint that the horse can't close his mouth and operate normally and naturally. And so if he's holding his mouth open a little bit and we get distressed by that, the first thing we'll do is we'll get a cavison out and basically tie his mouth shut. So what have we done? We have just made the stressful situation worse. So it's about how does it fit in the horse's mouth? And you don't see it too often, but you do see it. And I've had the maybe the good fortune or the bad fortune to see some horses that had really nice, big, fat, <clears throat> like that bit, it's a German hollow mouth. And yet the owner had ended up putting a cavison on and that didn't work. And so then they had a flash nose band on and this horse still couldn't really get his mouth closed. And it wasn't because he was trying not to close it. It's because he couldn't. So we need to think about that. Uh, there are various, depending on how the bits are made, will have more or less weight. And again, that can be a function of how the bit works but it also can be something that may be a preference of the rider and the horse. Some horses don't want a very heavy bit uh, and prefer to go with something a little bit lighter. Some of the bits have particular weights in them. Some of the shank bits will have weights that allow the bit to function in a different fashion. And ge generally what it does is it causes the bit to release when you put your hand or when you give back to the horse and take the pressure away from the reins that then they, that bit will move a little differently. We'll look at some of the different shapes that there has. You know, we typically think all bits are either round or oval, but you can get them square, you can get them triangle shape. Um, their texture, they may be a smooth bit like all of these three are, but maybe they're wrapped with something. Maybe they're twisted. Maybe they have some inlaid components to it. All different ways that we construct bits with the idea that hopefully it'll either give us the, the control and the communication we want, but we also need to think when we have some of those, what exactly is it doing? And as Mary Jane said, what are the mechanics of that particular bit? So if you just look at it thick or thin, so if we start at the bottom, we've got that German hollow mouth, and then we've got kind of a normal one, and then a very, very thin one. <clears throat> and while we might think this might have a stronger message, the level of comfort for the horse will be dependent on the structure of the horse's mouth, the size of his tongue, and certainly to a degree, your hands will have an impact. You know, and we also look at the mouthpiece because we'll see some that have multiple pieces to it. Um, so that top right hand picture is a French link. Uh, we have, you know, the basic straight bar with that rubber bit on the left-hand side. Uh, we've got a bit <clears throat> in the bottom right hand, that very first bit. So, you know, it's got a port. Um, this one's got a port in it, but also has uh, a place for the tongue to go, but also when we think about what are these gonna do when we take a hold of that, it's gonna be pretty impactful on that horse's tongue. Um, and so we need to be careful with that. And then another one that uh, not only has it got a port, but the way this roller functions, it allows you to pick up on this rein and it will swivel while you hold this one. So it actually moves in a swivel-like fashion. So the, the mechanics of the bit works differently. Some other things, so we can have you know, a twist, which is gonna give us an edge, and that's gonna have impact on the horse's tongue. It also is going to have some impact on the bars uh, versus this smooth bit that's not gonna have much of that. Here's one that if, hopefully you can tell, but it is square, so it's got four edges that have the opportunity to put a lot more concentrated pressure on the parts of the horse's mouth, particularly the bars 
and on the tongue uh, when we apply pressure to the reins. And then a twisted wire, uh, there's all kinds of these out there. They range anywhere from very tiny, uh, which would put a lot of, of pressure on the horse and be uh, quite strong. Uh, versus one that's going to have some ridges. It's going to have a little different message for the horse. This one's fairly large, again, but it's still going to have a much more significant message to the horse along his tongue, along the bars, compared to this, which is sort of smooth and, and is going to dissipate the pressure over the various parts of the horse's mouth. The other shape that we're starting to see now, more than certainly when I started riding, which was about the time of that very first bit that I showed you, uh, 1000 BC, or at least it seems like that, is we've started to put more shape into the, into the bits so that you can see where the pencil is, that we've got a gap. And that allows the bit to sit in a different way on the horse's tongue. It's gonna take some of the pressure off because it's gonna lay on his tongue a little bit differently um, and not have, the concentration of, of pressure. For horses that don't like to have a lot of pressure on the tongue, uh, these mulland mouth uh, bits have, have become very popular. There's a number of companies that make these. Um, when they first started out, you didn't see mulland mouth in anything other than a straight bar bit. And over the last number of years, we've started to make them like this so that they do provide a little bit of comfort for the horse. And certainly those horses that uh, don't want to have a lot of pressure on their tongue, uh, this kind of shape can really help. Still staying with the mouthpieces and then we can go through and if you look at the picture, you can see all sorts of things that we make bits out of. Uh, and there's reasons for it. Um, so if we start just from the top, you know, the sweet iron, <clears throat> uh, very old, material, been around for a long time. It's basically a cold rolled steel. Uh, the thing about sweet iron, and don't ask me if it tastes sweet because I have no idea. And I also don't recommend that you go to the tax store and start licking bits to see if they're sweet or not, because I don't know that it, you'll find out. But it does cause the horse to salivate a little bit. It will rust. And the belief is that through that whole process of rusting, uh, that the horse appreciates the taste of sweet iron. Uh, and certainly if we can get a horse to salivate a little bit more and keep his, his jaw and everything relaxed and soft, it really helps with our communications. So in a lot of the Western bits, you will see sweet iron. It's pretty common. Uh, you know, here's one down here. This would be a sweet iron bit. Um, that has a nice level of rust to it. Uh, that's one I rode with. I don't know if the horse liked it or not. Uh, that's just what he got ridden in, and I hope he did. Uh, copper, another one where we think about it causing salivation. Uh, copper has changed quite a bit in the last little while. Uh, these bits are pretty pure copper or a pure copper. You probably can't see it very well here, but this is a copper alloy. Um, it has a little other, few other metals because copper is soft. And by adding the other metals, it gets a little more strength to the mouthpiece. Uh, it lasts longer. Um, but again, copper will cause some salivation. And we think that that makes the horse happier in <clears throat> the way he goes and carries the bit. Chrome, really old been around a long time. Uh, you can usually tell really old chrome bits because if the chrome starts to separate from the metal, basically we take a, an iron bit and cover it or chrome it and uh, through a metallurgic process. But a lot of times that chrome will start to flake off and you'll start to see a lot of rust uh, in various parts. It'll also become a, a fairly rough mouthpiece where it can because of the way the chrome flakes off and probably not very comfortable for the horse. They are very inexpensive. Uh, they're easy to clean, they're bright and shiny. And so that's probably made them popular many years ago. Stainless steel is probably one of the most common and popular materials for making bits. 
Uh, a lot of these are stainless steel. Again, easy to clean. Uh, not probably much in the way of a taste from the horse's perspective, but easy to clean, very strong, uh, last a long time, and probably moderately uh, cost effective. Aluminum came as a mouthpiece and a bit. Uh, I, years ago, one of the things about aluminum, if we think that we want salivation from the iron and the copper, uh, aluminum does exactly the opposite. It'll actually dry their mouth out. It is lightweight, it is fairly strong, uh, but because of how it plays in the horse's mouth, hasn't been terribly popular as a mouthpiece, but it's a very popular metal for making bits. Um, typically a lot of Western shank bits will have aluminum uh, shanks and cheeks because they're a little bit lighter. So they'll have an aluminum shank and then a sweet iron or a copper or another material for the mouthpiece. Uh, German silver is not silver. It is just an amalgamation of a number of metals. Uh, kind of, I don't think you can see my German sil silver bit in here. Kind of has a little bit of a different color. Uh, has some copper in it. And some people seem to think that it works very nicely. Uh, rubber bits, uh, you can have rubber covered bits. We see that a lot. Uh, one of the things that I find with a lot of the rubber covered bits is it, we believe it to be a softer, more gentle kind of material to have in your horse's mouth, but most of those bits are really thick. And so if we have a horse that doesn't have a large mouth, um, putting all that extra rubber on there may just make it more uncomfortable for them. And a lot of that rubber is not that soft anyway, so, but they can get a hold of it. They will chew on it, uh, so maybe it does give them some sort of a pacifier effect, but you'll find that in a lot of cases, some of those rubber bits are really well chewed down towards the center part of the joint on a snaffle bit is typically where you will see that. We have vulcanite, which is a man-made material. We have happy mouth, another man-made material that some horses like, some horses don't. Uh, I think, Dr. Camargo, this is your happy mouth bit that we traded bits for down here in the corner. Um, I think Dr. Camargo's horse wasn't as happy with her happy mouth as uh, the advertisement said she should be, um, but uh, they're available. Some horses really like them. They will come flavored, uh, so you can have them anywhere from apple, peanut butter, all sorts of different flavors. And then lastly, uh, this is actually a a uh, leather bit right here. And they are kind of coming back in some circles. I noticed at Equitana, there was a gentleman there selling leather bits. Issue with those is trying to keep them in good shape and kind of keep the horses from chewing through them because in a lot of cases, it is just a piece of leather that has been sewn together. And so if they do chew through it, uh, you may have a little less control and communication because there will be nothing in their mouth. There are also leather bits or leather covered bits. It's much like the rubber covered bits. Uh, so there is a steel uh, mouthpiece and then it is covered with leather so that there's something for the horse either to chew on or take a hold of. And for some horses, um, they certainly like to do that. I have a friend that says her horse just loves going in the, the leather bit that she bought for him. And um, I'm glad that that's the case. So all of the bits have those components. They all have a mouthpiece. They're going to be made out of a variety of things, depending on the bit manufacturer. And you pick and choose what you think will be the, give you the most comfort for your horse and still give you the best communication. So when we think about a snaffle bit, a snaffle bit is that kind of bit that takes direct pressure from the reins and translate that direct pressure to the horse. Uh, there's no mechanical advantage. It's just if you pull five pounds of pressure, then the horse feels five pounds of pressure. And it doesn't matter what the mouthpiece is. It matters how the mechanics of the bit function. So, all bits have a mouthpiece. Uh, the snaffle bit will have a ring of some sort. Um, there might be a joint if there is one. 
a lot of people think that this is the traditional, typical, only kind of snaffle bit, and that is not true. You saw in pictures earlier, we had some ports, we had some different joints, we had a straight bar. So there's a lot of different ways, but they all work on the same principle of direct pressure. No mechanical advantage. And so where do they impact? Well, on the corners of the horse's mouth, all bits do that. Depending on the shape and the structure on the bars of their interdental space. Um, yes, it will impact the tongue because depending on how that bit is constructed, it may actually have what we call a nutcracker effect uh, on their tongue. And depending on your hands and the size of the horse's mouth and the bit, yes, a snaffle bit can have an impact on the palate. So if you have kind of aggressive hands and you really have to take hold of your horse, there is the chance that when it, and I don't know if you can see this up in the top, but when it goes together like that, it has the potential to go up into the palate of the horse. So it can, we don't want it to, but that possibility does exist. Now, if I have one like this, so this one, and hopefully you can see it all right, making sure. So pretty tight. It, it's going to grab my finger. Uh, and, and trust me, if you don't believe me, get a couple of snaffle bits next time at your 4-H meeting and take turns putting your finger in the joint and having your friend squeeze it till you say, uncle. Now, what you want to do is when it's your turn to have your finger in there, get one that has a hinge joint, not the typical snaffle joint, because this hinge joint only goes so far. So the mechanics of this is it's not going to pinch the tongue in the same manner, because this is as tight as I can make it. And there are two kinds like this. There's this hinge joint that works like that. It doesn't do much the other way. It's pretty firm, uh, almost like a straight bar this way. But if you have to, to pull back, it's going to be like that. There's also some where this is a ball joint, and it does exactly the same thing. It makes a bit of a difference. So when we look at it and we put the pressure on the reins, you know, what's going to happen? <clears throat> We're going to pull back. Uh, we're going to have a different impact on how much pressure we put, not only on the tongue, but on the bars. And uh, that can be fairly significant. And if, if we add a leverage to that, which is a mechanical advantage, then there's the opportunity to have a little more pressure. When we go with, ooh, let me do that one, uh, the French link, which adds something and in a lot of uh, breed and discipline associations, the construction of this is very regulated. This has to be a certain size uh, and those sorts of things. But there again, it's not going to pinch in the same way. And you're also not going to ever have this give you pallet pressure because it just can't. Um, it's going to be a lot softer. And again, a lot of horses truly in appreciate just the way this breaks over their tongue and fits kind of nicely and moderates where the pressure goes. Now, you'll also talk to some people that would never use one of those. And why is that? It's called personal preference and experience. And it is what it is. Some people like them. Some people don't like them. Uh, if the horse does or doesn't, I think that's probably more important than what you and I like. So from a snaffle, we have a variety of types and there's gonna be a little bit of a theme here. So we have our loose ring, just as it's, or O-ring, uh, that ring moves. Uh, we get a lot of, can get a lot of movement. We'll come back here. Mary Jane, when they set my computer up, they didn't do it left to right. They did it right to left. <clears throat> so through here, we're going to get movement, some vertical movement, and we're also going to get some horizontal movement. So 
from a, a mechanic standpoint or how it gives direction to the horse, it can be a little bit confusing. It's not an absolute direct message to the horse. Um, you can also have some issues with the potential of that pinching in the corners of the horse's mouth. So you gotta be a little bit careful, but a straight bar bit, straight bar loose ring snaffle, a jointed loose ring snaffle, and a French link loose ring snaffle. So it's a loose ring snaffle because of this. It's got nothing to do with these things. Those are just the mouthpieces. And so when we put pressure on them, it is direct pressure, but does have a little bit of movement with the loose ring. When we go to the egg butt snaffle, so now we have more of a fixed ring. This is going to stay pretty solid. It's not going to move very much. And so from a message to the horse, this gives them a much clearer message. We also have, because of this being fixed, that as we pull on this rein that way, we are going to put some pressure here on the side of the horse's face. So we get a little bit of lateral pressure on the side of the horse's face. It's not a lot, and you shouldn't be pulling so hard that it is a lot, but it does give a very clear message, and uh, in some parts of the industry, uh, a very widely used and appreciated bit. But notice, the mouthpieces are exactly the same as the last slide. So I've got my jointed, I've got my straight bar, I've got my French link. Um, and what's the difference? Is the kind of ring that this snaffle is. The other one, and this has all kinds of names, uh, the D ring because it looks like a D. Some people call them hunter Ds, some call them racing Ds, some people call them D bits. Um, but again, it, it is like the egg butt in the fact that we have a fixed part right here. And so the message is much clearer and cleaner to the horse. Uh, we, we're starting to see a few more that are shaped like this. Uh, this is an older bit. And so very much the, the traditional, typical D. And then in the Western world, if they're using a D-ring, it's probably gonna look more like this. Uh, a smaller fixture there, uh, it's gonna be a little, little less of lateral pressure. Um, and I think in some cases it gets confused with, is this really a D-ring or is this really an egg butt? Uh, but if you look in some of the Western disciplines and they tell you that you can use the snaffle bit, and in some cases, they will tell you you can use a snaffle bit and it has to be either an O-ring or a D-ring, and this will be the picture. So they are very specific in what you are allowed to use if you're competing in some Western disciplines. And then the full cheek snaffle. I always find it interesting when you read the whole purpose for the full cheek snaffle, it is to give lateral pressure. And the other thing is that these great long side pieces are so you as a rider cannot pull the bit through the horse's mouth. If you're pulling that hard that you think this is going to go through his mouth, um, we are all in trouble and we need to stop and think about it. There's a slight difference between the full cheek and the fulmer. They look very much the same other than the fulmer has a loose ring <clears throat> attachment. So there's maybe a little more flexibility in how the bit operates. These ones are to be used with a keeper. And so you typically will see these in the English disciplines and they will have a keeper on there so that it does two things. It helps to sort of stabilize the bit and the mouthpiece in the horse's mouth. So it adds to that mechanics. It may give you a little bit of a leverage because of uh, how that keeper works. And it certainly keeps the arm of the bit out of the way. Uh, and again, in some disciplines, in a lot of the Western disciplines, you are not allowed to use a full cheek snaffle. 
um, because you don't ride with the keepers because of the bridle and so they are not allowed. Um, also, if you are the man from Snowy River, uh, it's a movie for those of you that have never seen it. It's a wonderful movie with a great buckskin horse. Um, he doesn't use keepers on his full cheek snaffle either. So when we put it on, and this bit's a tiny bit big for Eli, and you can tell to a certain degree right in here, so there is a wrinkle. He has, the, I have the bit set on him, so there's just enough pressure in the corners that there is a slight wrinkle in the corner. Um, if he was actually going to wear this and I was going to ride him with this, I would like this to be just a little tighter, um, probably just under a quarter of an inch between this part. And you can get your... Uh, fixed ring bits so like a egg butt or a d or a full cheek you can have them a little tighter uh, to the horse's face um, you don't want them jammed up really tight but you can get them a little bit tighter uh, because there's really no area here for that to pinch so uh, that makes it a little easier on the horse if it was a loose ring snapple you would probably want to be in that quarter inch so that you're not having the opportunity for that loose ring and the mouthpiece of the bit that catch anything in uh, the corners of the horse's mouth. You will see some bits, and I didn't get one out, um, where you will have, I don't know if I can wave my hands around enough, but you will see where there will be a collar on the mouthpiece and it goes up and down. <coughs> just a little bit outside of the mouthpiece. And what that does is it just gives a little bit of protection. And actually it looks a little bit what, like this copper on this egg butt, uh, but the O-ring slides through it. And that just helps to protect from pinching. Um, you need to be really careful with those bits. There are some out there that they have made that collar quite long and maybe not very well fitted. And so it doesn't actually slide. So it's no longer a true O-ring or a loose ring snaffle. And you can have uh, some rather confusing messages because sometimes it'll slide and sometimes it won't. So I think you want to be really careful. If I was buying one that had a collar on it and it was an O-ring snaffle, I would be playing in the, the tax store to make sure that that bit would actually slide just so that it's going to do the job you want it to do. So the last that we can talk about are curb bits. So they have leverage. There is a mechanical advantage. It is like, it, well, it is a lever. I always think about it so that if you're trying to get somebody off the teeter-totter, if you change where the fulcrum is, it can a small person can launch a big person because you have a mechanical advantage. So with the curb bit, we're going to have a curb strap curb chain, chin strap, whatever we would like to call it. It is going to be attached to the, the top of the bit and it is going to help to provide us with our leverage. And so as this moves, as we pull back, this is going to come up, this is going to go forward, this is going to engage. And as this is going this way, we're putting pressure on the pole through the bridle. So we have a number of places that it works. We're also going to have some impact on the bars, the corners of the horse's mouth, and the horse's tongue. Now, depending on the structure of the bit, we may or may not have any impact on the palate. <clears throat> so they all have pieces and parts, uh, things to remember. Uh, you know, the, the, the bridle ring, we're going to have a mouthpiece. It may or may not have a port. Uh, it will depend. Uh, there's always some debate. Is this the shank or the cheek? Uh, you can, depending on whose jargon you're using, it all comes out to be the same. We do look at the purchase 
which is from the bridle ring to the center of the mouthpiece. And that's an important uh, part of the construction because it adds to the mechanics. The shorter the purchase, the longer from here down, the more leverage that we are going to get. If we lengthen here and it becomes close to here, then all of a sudden our leverage has not been as strong and kind of gone away. <clears throat> so where we already talked about this, but you know we're going to have pressure on the, the bars, the tongue, the palate, the curb, or the chin groove, and the pole. They're all going to be there. We'll also have a little bit on the corners of the horse's mouth because depending on how we actually bridle our horses. And so as that bit moves forward, uh, so this one would have a port. We're seeing that it's moving forward. And then depending on the structure of this, we may or may not have impact with the horse's palate. So we're going to think about the structure of the mouthpiece, uh, how wide it is. No different than the other bits. Uh, the width of the mouthpiece is important, whether it is a snaffle bit or a curb bit. You can get some very narrow uh, structured curb bits. So that's going to, again, concentrate the pressure where that narrow mouthpiece fits. Uh, we're going to think about the port. Uh, if there is one, we're going to look at their shanks. Uh, how long are they? What shape are they? Are they fixed like this bit in the picture or are they loose? And we are going to have a curb strap or a curb chain. It is interesting and as an aside, one of the rules for tacking equipment that AQHA came out with a number of years ago is that if you are riding with a curb bit, you must use a curb strap or a curb chain which I thought was an interesting rule for them to put out because didn't everybody do that? Well, I guess not. And what the curb strap does, in addition to engaging the leverage component, it also does have uh, a bit of a, of a function to keep the bit from going too far forward, which can cause the horse quite a bit of discomfort. So there's reasons. When we look at the port, uh, how high is it going to be? The reason I have two inches on there is that in a normal mouthed horse, whatever that looks like, if the port is less than two inches, the chances of that port having any interaction with the hard powder, the roof of the horse's mouth, goes down dramatically. It needs to be at least two inches or taller if you're going to have pallet pressure. When we look at how width, wide the, the port is, uh, because that ties in with the tongue relief, so how does it give a place for the tongue to go that sort of allows the horse to have some comfort? Um, I always look at some of the ones, uh, this one down here, uh, jamming your tongue up into that narrow piece and having it kind of squished, Sometimes I wonder how much comfort that really is, how much relief that gives, but um, it appears that that may be the case. And then we can actually just look at the shape. So on this very old, um, this is a half breed bit. It's a unique half breed because most half breeds did not have loose shanks back in the day, uh, but a very straight, and that's very common, uh, half breed bits that they have a straight bar mouthpiece. This is what, when I grew up, was sort of what we thought of when we talked about a mouthpiece. It was in, you know, just had a lot, slight amount of shape to it, uh, gave a little bit of tongue relief, but when we start to change any of that, we're going to change where the pressure is going to be. So as we do more of this, or curve our mouthpiece, we're going to end up putting more pressure here and here which is on the bars of the horse's mouth. And so we need to appreciate that by changing the structure of the bit, we are going to change where it interacts. When you measure it, you measure from the bottom. Um, so this one's pretty close to three inches. Uh, for most Western disciplines, that bit is legal. Uh, it's called a cathedral mouthpiece. Uh, the other thing that's important from a 
mouthpiece standpoint is, and again, in most disciplines, there can be nothing down here. Not allowed to have any protrusions below the bars of the bit. So we can't have something coming down here that's going to interact with the horse's tongue. Those are those are not allowed. You and you can hardly buy them uh, anymore. <clears throat> but when we look at just the differences in the ports, so here we have uh, not a really high port, but lots of room. So if you have a horse that needs a little more room for his tongue, this would be uh, very good. But if you also have too much room for their tongue and the horse wants to hold the bit with his tongue and keep it up off his bars, because they will do that, they will use their tongue to kind of lift the bit up so this part doesn't interact with the bars of, of his mouth. So uh, again, it becomes very uh, trial and error to figure out what makes your horse the most comfortable. Um, again, a very small port with a little bit of, of tongue relief and then whoop, whoa, a mullen mouth uh, at the bottom. And so when we look at it, you can just see that as we change, and we have a little bit of tongue relief, we are going to change how uh, it does impact on the horse's tongue. And if he can lift it up, he can have an opportunity to protect the bars of his mouth. Shank length and <clears throat> shank ratio. So that is this from the, the purchase to the rest of the shank. And it's to the uh, you do your calculations based on the center of rain pull. So it's not to the bottom of the ring, but it's to where the rain pull would be. Um, uh, from a mechanical standpoint, that actually makes sense. And so as we do, we would take the purchase and divide it into the shank length. So that would give us a ratio of three to one. <clears throat> and if we had more purchase and a shorter shank, all of a sudden as we get closer to a one-to-one -one ratio, our amount of leverage goes down dramatically. As we make changes in the shape of our shanks uh, and start to sweep them back, so we get to this one, which would be very close to what they used to call the grazing bit. Uh, it's not actually the original grazing bit, but that's what we call it now. And the thought process was if the horse puts his head down, the shanks of the bit are gonna be out of the way so he could actually graze a little grass if he wanted to. But as we go from straight to this swept back shank, we are losing leverage. And we're also changing how quick the message from your hands to the mouth happen. So if I have a, a bit like this, this one might do. Everybody has a tack room in their office, right? So, you know, pretty straight. So as I move, it doesn't take very much and all of a sudden that mouthpiece is gonna start to move. So he's gonna have the understanding that it's time to pay attention because I'm giving him a signal. Whereas if I have that swept back, uh, and I don't have any of my swept backs, and this one's kind of got that a little bit. So uh, kind of gentle, it's gonna be a very slow message. It has, so is this a snapple bit? No, this is a shank bit with a jointed mouthpiece. A nice term to use, jointed, because then we know what it is. But it's going to have a little slower message and not quite so much leverage. And there's all kinds, aren't there? I mean, we think of curb bits, or in a lot of cases, people think of curb bits as it relates to the Western side of the horse industry only. Um, not true. Uh, so we have, you know, here for a saddlebred, this would be Western. Uh, this one's Western. And if you think about the fact that this mouthpiece has got edges on it, we've got leverage. Um, if we have very strong hands, 
this is going to send a very, very strong message to the horse that uh, he may or may not like. Um, it's staying in my garage, so horses don't have to worry about it. You know, the Kimberwick, well, it is allowed in the hunter world. It is not considered to be the appropriate bit for hunters, but it does give you leverage. We have a place to put a curb chain on here. We can fix our reins. And as we change the rein area that we fix it in, it becomes or strengthens the amount of leverage. It's still not got a lot of leverage, but it will give you some. Uh, another saddlebred bit, uh, this one's got wrapped copper wire, uh, which they allow, but a lot of other disciplines do not, even though the copper is going to help us with salivation and those sorts of things. In a lot of cases, because it's wrapped, it is not allowed. Um, here we have a sweet iron with stainless steel cheeks. Uh, the traditional, and I, I don't know why this became the traditional uh, walking horse bit, but that's what everybody calls them. Um, it's basically just a shank bit. Uh, what is interesting, and you can kind of see the tape measure, uh, walking horse bits actually measure from here to the bottom of the rain ring, whereas most others measure uh, from the, the top of the, the, you know, the bridle ring to the center of pull. And if you've got one that's got a little bit of sweep to it, like this one does, or this one, you measure like this. Nope, where are you? Here we go. Nope, got it in the wrong place. Anyway, this becomes your shank length. So yes, you have a little more shank, so that's gonna add a little bit of weight, but when you do your measurement, you don't try to follow the curve of the shank because that will make you crazy. And then our pelum. So here we have one of those vulcanized mouthpieces. Um, if we're in the dressage world, we're going to measure from here to here. Um, and they don't worry about the other parts. So if you're riding with, with different disciplines, if you're using different pieces of equipment, it is your job and responsibility to know, number one, how it works. And number two, can I use it? And some of the Disciplines and breed associations are pretty good at giving us direction. Some of them I question that um, they could have written them in English because it would have just made it a little more useful. So with all of those curb bits, we are going to have a curb strap or a chain. Uh, it does contribute to the leverage. It, it is what kind of, uh, if you get the pull against a little bit, it's going to put pressure on the chin groove and certainly can have an effect on the action of the bit. <clears throat> Part of that's gonna be changed by how tight you make that curb chain. And again, uh, we follow some uh, thumb rules within the industry. Typically you're supposed to have two fingers between the curb chain and the horse's jaw. Uh, certainly if you tighten it a little bit, um, it's gonna give your message a little more uh, strength to it. Probably going to get to them a little faster because it's not going to take as long till we're starting to put pressure uh, on the chin groove. Uh, and you look at some uh, disciplines and, and their curb chains, curb straps are actually quite uh, snug. You can put things on them like the, uh, the rubber cover if you've got a horse that is uh, very sensitive but you're riding him with one of those shank bits that you need to have a curb chain on. So you can do that to kind of protect them. You'll see some will wrap it with latex. Again, they want the action of the curb chain, but they don't want the pressure to annoy the horse. And they come in all shapes and sizes. So we've got the, you know, the, there's single link, there's double link, there's the one with, you know, it's got the, the it's leather. We have leather curb straps in the Western world. Uh, we have a variety of different chains. And again, if you're showing, a lot of these actually have rules and regulations as to what the chain can look like, how it needs to be. Uh, and 
there is good direction. And I think it is done in order to, to think about the health and welfare of the horse. And then just lastly, uh, so how you put, the, put them on, again, the old rule of thumb used to always be one or two wrinkles at the corners. So here with this uh, short shank bit, uh, he's, he's wearing it with a wrinkle uh, <clears throat> in the bit that he normally goes in. Uh, there's no wrinkle. And he actually rides very nicely with just a uh, very uh, snug fit right there, but not snug enough to have any wrinkles. And it seems to make him very happy. Uh, and he goes along quite nicely. So the last thing to remember, so snaffle bits, it is the direct pressure. It is not the mouthpiece. And the curb bit is the leverage. And again, not the mouthpiece because it is whether or not we have all of this and then we can uh, have an impact. Uh, we don't know, you can probably guess that this is a jointed mouthpiece, but we would have to guess it to what this particular mouthpiece is because we can't tell. And just because it's a curb bit doesn't mean that it has a port. Uh, there's a lot of bits out there, a lot of curb bits out there that have a port, but it's probably less than half an inch. So it does give a little bit of tongue relief, but it really doesn't do much more than that. It probably does give that tongue relief and make it a little less uh, strong as if it was just a straight bar bit. So um, there we go. Uh, you can put all kinds of things on horses. Um, and they will go along happy as can be. And I think Mary Jane, we are right at our, I think I'm five minutes over time. You said- I was gonna end. say, yeah, it usually runs six to seven. So you hit it right on the nose, Dr. Coleman. Thank you. Yeah, well, I had to, I had to give up five minutes to you. <laughs> well, there we go. Now everybody can go do their homework. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>